Harvard professor Edward O. Wilson is a world leader in conservation, renowned for his work in biodiversity, and he's been awarded two Pulitzer Prizes for his nonfiction writing. Our Jeff Lockwood talked in depth with E.O. Wilson about his latest book, a nonfiction story about a boy growing up in rural Alabama. Ed, I really appreciate your coming to uh, visit with me today. I've been a, uh, a fan, a scientific fan for 30 years. I, I, I even brought your, one of your books that I got in graduate school to uh, maybe have you sign it. So this is a big deal for me, and I, I appreciate it a great deal. Great being here. I get, feel better about Wyoming and already every day, uh, every minute, I should say, and I, I always felt uh, good about the state. Well, one of the things that, that really interests me about your career, especially very recently, is your devotion to uh, conservation, to the protection of biodiversity. And you've amassed tremendous amounts of data, technical papers, books, reasoned arguments, rational analysis, and now a novel. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, isn't science sufficient? Don't facts speak for themselves? What is it that storytelling can do, or what do you want fiction to do that can't be done otherwise, if anything? Unfortunately, all that we have been doing is not enough. The world is going green, that's good, pastel green. <laughs> uh, getting greener all the time, but it's mostly uh, concerned only with the physical environment. Uh, climate change, resources mm -hmm. disappearing. And uh, not enough attention is being paid to the living world. We're losing species and ecosystems probably at an accelerating rate. So we need everything we can bring to bear in the armamentarium to bring public over to the defense of the living world, as well as uh, moderation in dealing with the physical world. And mm -hmm. So I've used everything in I can think of. Uh, it wasn't the only reason that I wrote the novel, I wanted to go home in a way <laughs> mentally to uh, my birthplace, Alabama, uh, where the action takes place. But I long ago realized that while people respect nonfiction, mm -hmm. they read <laughs> novels. People need a story. Mm -hmm. They love a story. And if you don't give them a story, then you're likely uh, to um, have them just fall into a sense that this is something they need to memorize or understand, you know, because it's good. But reading a story is what we're all about. That's how the mind works. So, so facts might change our minds, right? But stories touch our hearts. Is that, is that the move you're making here? I think you have to have the combination. Mm -hmm. uh, Nonfiction has been giving the facts abundantly about what's happening right. in the world. Yeah. And sometimes we're able to write about it with passion, and that's done a lot of good, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely necessary. But there are other ways of putting over um, uh, the sense of urgency important, and that way is uh, in part by telling stories. You know, you can mm -hmm. either tell a a wonderful adventure story of what really happened in the course of exploring biodiversity or mm -hmm. saving it. Or you can bring it home much more closely by bringing characters to life mm -hmm. with whom people can identify. Yeah, so do you have a concern? I, I, so one of the things I hear from scientists, right, is that we have to maintain our objectivity. We have to maintain our neutrality, right? And otherwise, we, we sacrifice our credibility. We can't step across that line of activism or advocacy. But you have, um, and you've s certainly maintained your uh, extraordinarily high respect as a scientist. What, what is the proper relationship between passion? You yeah. use the word passion sure. as a scientist and credibility and objectivity. You know, uh, I like to say that the ideal scientist, you know, mm -hmm. the, and the, include the most creative scientist, think like a poet, work like a bookkeeper, <laughs> and then uh, they should present uh, their results carefully and objectively in a, uh, in, in a uh, way that can be trusted, that mm -hmm. the information can be trusted. Uh, I thought uh, that scientists were supposed to be outside the rest of public affairs uh, right on 
till the 70s or mm -hmm. late 60s. Uh, and that's, I, that's when I was a scientist until uh, that time. Uh, pure, I didn't, I thought I'd leave, I thought maybe the World Wildlife Fund will take care of this stuff, yeah. They <laughs> I'll give like them a, the facts. Yeah, they're pretty, they, exactly. I felt our job was to lay the facts out. But then I realized that it wasn't working and that uh, scientists really need carefully to get into the fray, but uh, only if it really is important to get into the fray. Mm -hmm. And the parallel case would be um, the astronomer okay. spots the 10 kilometer wide meteorite <laughs> on a trajectory <laughs> toward the Earth. Uh, now, what is he supposed to do? Well, he could publish, publish in science. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Publish it in science, you know, and hope that somebody uh, reads that, it. Yeah, that a congressman <laughs> or somebody's going to read it. You know, that's not what's going to happen. We are in, and this is a scientific subject. Yeah, the biodiversity, right. what it is, how much there is, how it's disappearing, uh, you know, how it's important in ecosystems, and of course, you know, how it's going to be very important for humans. Right. Also, all objectively studied, but there's a crisis. There's an urgency, and this is one of those subjects. Now, I, I wouldn't expect um, a, uh, a scientist, let us say, working on the tertiary structure of uh, Dibublio muttes <laughs> to uh, say, there's an urgency here. <laughs> hey, listen. Maybe if it was carcinogenic, but other than that, eh? Well, not even that. <laughs> you know, Dibublio muttes may be an auxiliary uh, enzyme uh, for uh, digesting, um, uh, you know, fatty tissue or something. I don't I know, see. but the point is you, that you get the point. Yes. There are yes, certain things enough. that matter yes. a lot right now to the whole world, and this is one of them. Well, let, let, let me play around with that, especially with your, your, your novel. So what, there are things that matter to the whole world, but it, it just occurs to me, and you can tell me if I'm just off base here, that I mean, science is oftentimes about big ideas, right? Universal truths and laws and theories like, say, the theory of island biogeography, big conceptual things. Um, but in my experience or my intuition is that people have a hard time caring about the planet, species, biodiversity, um, humanity. It seems to me what people really care about are the particulars, mm -hmm. their friends, their place, sure. the organisms they know. Mm -hmm. is, is that what Ant Hill is about? Is it about talking to people where they actually care when what we've often done in science is we're talking these big global sweeping abstract terms? You know about scientists, before I answer that question, I think very few scientists really care about those big issues. Well, they do, but not much more than any other educated person. Mm -hmm. They have to make a living. <laughs> And as you know, science is doubling every 20 years or so, the amount of science, which means that we have to, uh, a young scientist has to work furiously, uh, you know, like a, a California gold miner in 1852. <laughs> uh, to stake, get to the- Stake to the, a claim and-, and Yeah, absolutely, to get, get to the frontier and stake a claim, and it's, it means total dedication. It's important. But uh, most scientists don't have time to think about the broader implications of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Science, a scientist's career uh, is all about discovery. If you don't make an original discovery, you're not a scientist. Right. You can talk about science, <laughs> you know a lot about it and everything, but oddly, uh, you become a scientist when you have that, uh, that achievement. It can be a small, narrow achievement, but then you are. But at any rate, um, true. People are concerned about a very limited uh, time, space-time horizon. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they care about what's going to happen to them in the next few years, mostly maximally. If they think about humanity, they really rarely think more than a generation or two ahead. Sure. And really, when you come down to it, uh, they may watch a, uh, a championship soccer match <laughs> going on in Portugal, but that's just a fun thing, you know, like going to a good movie uh, or 
Um, they may worry about North Korea, that kind of thing. But what they're really concerned about is their neighborhood, their friends, uh, their job, and that's natural. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do, I believe, is to present material as interestingly as possible, and as I've done in this novel, to make a, a person and, and a small group of people uh, identifiable to a broad audience mm -hmm. so that you connect with them and you come to care what they care about and what they care about and the fight they have, developer versus uh, environmentalist versus the right-wing evangelicals. What they care about, you come to care about, as you do in a novel, mm -hmm. uh, and a story and a movie you attend and so on. But now we realize, they realize when they're reading it, that this is important to them. You know, I'm, um, my model in a way is um, Harper Lee. She wrote one novel, <laughs> but she wrote it 50 years ago, almost to the day, you know, that uh -huh. 50 years ago. They just celebrated, right. actually, a couple months ago, the 50th anniversary. And she uh, wrote it at the cusp of the civil rights movement. And she identified for a lot of people who realized that this was a big problem for them personally right. and for society. That's what I've tried to done with, do with this. So, so the Harper Lee, I mean, one of my favorites is William Blake, right? And mm -hmm. to see the world in a grain of sand and yes. heaven in a wildflower. So right. my sense of the book is, is here is a particular from which, with a bit of reflection, one sees the universal. That's why I chose ants. <laughs> well, of course, I've spent my lifetime working <laughs> on ants. Right about what but, you know, is that what they say? Yes, that's right. But you know, ants are the most in, uh, important insects in the world because they make up, well, two-thirds uh, two of the biomass. That is, if you weigh all the insects in the world, two-thirds are ants. Nice. They own the world. And they're enormously important in the environment. So when I have in the book, which is about a young fellow, it's a coming of age, right? Uh, who uh, is, uh, develops a deep love of a part of a wild environment near his home uh, that uh, he comes to dedicate himself to saving because it's under, uh, you know, it can Pressure be developed at any, any right. time. Uh, that uh, when I describe what it is he wants to save and why he wants to save it mm -hmm. in some depth, uh, then I take as a signature uh, creatures, not a bear, Right. You know, not, yeah, right, right, not, not birds, squirrels, or yeah, so fuzzy, on, charismatic megafauna. You immediately right. uh, identify with. But these creatures have civilizations in the dirt underneath their feet and show uh, how they, they live their lives. So the central quarter of the book, this is what was picked up by the New Yorker. Right, for is, is that, that, that is student's thesis, right? Is that's correct. Uh, and uh, what this is, is a exact description of what ants really do, how they communicate, mm -hmm. what the, their, um, uh, their, the, how they signal, what their um, activities are, uh, their constant war. I take the reader through a cycle of uh, four colonies at war. All of that, uh, and, and their parades, they have tournaments in which colonies yes. test one another's fighting ability. It's amazing because they have such an extremely high social organization. And everything you read in there is based upon fact. It's the first time an ant civilization has been described. And Woody Allen does not enter anywhere. <laughs> uh, I've, it's, uh, we're planning a movie now. I'm thinking it's close to closing, you know, uh, uh, making this arrangement. And we're, what we'd like to do is to make this almost as exciting, at least, as the Iliad, yes, and right, who right. actually have the ants communicating okay. as they actually do by pheromones, odors they release, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we have subtitles. Sub subtitles, oh, that's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, with the, uh, the pheromones shown as um, uh, accurately, because mm -hmm. we know exactly how these what, molecules... What the information is, right? Absolutely, yeah. and how, they, uh, how, the, uh, how, how much uh, pheromone is released and for how long. And so the ants will be talking to one another with English